Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the daily chart of gold and silver overlaid. So a couple of trend lines. You can see fairly major trend lines starting back in about September, October of 2012. Uh, you can see most of the major touch points. Not exactly. It misses this one a little bit but uh, it touches right there and you can see decisively broken out right there the other one is this trend line formed from this top here and it's got one two uh, maybe three touch points and you can see also decisively broken out in fact this this pennant here uh, kind of tested back and then and rallied you can see it's it, it's broken out to the upside, but it's it's falling back. That's typical with a pennant. Silver, on the other hand, you can see it's actually below this trend line. It hasn't broken out of the first trend line, much less even approached the second trend line. So it's lagging very, very badly. If we take the all the indicators off, you can see how badly it's lagging gold. Now, we just had a report that Canada has sold off essentially the last ounces, really, the last ton that they had of gold. And it's very interesting because when they did that, they commented about how, well, gold is really just like silver. It's just a commodity. And so if that's the case, then we would expect to see um, gold and silver go up together as commodities, and I think we will. I think that gold's going to lead the way. I don't, I don't buy that. I don't believe that either is a commodity. They're actually alternatives to a corrupt, uh, not just paper money system, but actually a corrupt electronic money system, which is a gigantic Ponzi scheme. But let's pull it out to the weekly and show you how extreme this is. You can see on the daily that this is th this is definitely the most extreme um, disparity that we've had between these two prices since the beginning of February of this year for the last uh, four years running. Now, if we pull out to the weekly here, you can see that uh, that shows you how much silver is still lagging gold, tremendously lagging gold. If you want to just get a comparison, uh, just go silver is the left scale and gold is the right scale on a comparative basis based on the weekly with them both breaking out and bottoming. Uh, bottoming in 1999, breaking out in 2003. Uh, this is a pretty good comparison. Um, you can see that we have gold trading at the equivalent of a $31 silver price and silver trading at the equivalent of a $700 gold price. So a big catch up move to do. Now, do we have a uh, precedent for this, a comparison that we can use? Yes, I think we do. Really, the only other one we've seen, which is not quite as extreme as this one, but it's going to be this one right here. And that's going to be the big, big rally. You can see that uh, silver started to go sideways while gold was rallying. And then, boom. It exploded and you can see it was one move where it actually surpassed it. What does that project for silver? Well, we can just do a gold silver ratio here. Uh, let's just do a real rough one here and say that gold was 2000 and silver was 50. We people gave them both a little bit, uh, gave $100 to gold and $2 to silver, but uh, $2,000 and $50, so what is that? Um, is that a 40 to 1 ratio? I think that's right, yeah. So it's a 40 to 1 ratio. So that's about half where we are right now on the gold-silver ratio. So things are going to change pretty soon, I believe, and change dramatically uh, as they both begin to continue up. And again, I've covered many times how they already are doing that in other currencies. This is just in the dollar. So let's get to the main topic of the night. Before we do that, 
let's take a look at the cryptocurrencies. Now, I wanted to explain, a lot of people are asking a lot of questions about Ethereum and what I mean by saying it's stealing market share. Well, this, again, this is the number that you want to keep an eye on. And again, that's just from this WorldCoin Index site. That's the one I go to most often. That's the one I'm going to be looking at. Now, the highest that this number has reached so far recently has been 8.3 billion. You can see that it is it has come off from that by about 0.3 billion. So total money, total world money supply that has gone into cryptocurrencies is down about 0.3 billion from where it was. Now, that does not account for the difference between this one I'm watching very closely, Ethereum, and you can see it's $11.33 a coin for Ethereum, and, and they're almost up to a billion dollars in market cap. It actually crossed over $900 million today. So if we just go to the home and, and, and look at all the currencies, you can see the charts show you pretty much the picture without just breaking down the math. Obviously, Bitcoin is still the top dog with uh, that nearly $600 billion market cap, but you can see the chart going down. Litecoin is, is having a decent rally. I have a lot more money in Litecoin than I do have in Bitcoin. And then you can see Ethereum, Factoids, MadeSafe, Monero, and Dash, and uh, Storage, I believe as well. You can see all these alternatives to Bitcoin. They are having tremendous, tremendous rallies. Now, people have asked me, well, you're, you're talking about shorting these and, and uh, you know, why are you doing that? Well, the theory behind shorting some of these coins, and again, I'm not short any of these coins right now. Uh, I have been short Ethereum and MadeSafe, uh, picking this top, got out of even as soon as it started to uh, begin to approach new highs. So I'm trying to pick a top, but that's a very difficult thing to do. But... Uh, you know, if you're going to short these cryptocurrencies, you need to be able to get out really, really fast. Uh, the point with the market cap switching is that as Bitcoin is going down, uh, some of these other coins are going up. Now, with Ethereum hitting almost a billion, um, I mentioned how it was around 10% of, of Bitcoin. If it hits a billion, then that makes it one sixth, that makes it 16% of Bitcoin as the others are catching up to this factoids coin and uh, storage and a lot of others. So be very, very careful if you're shorting any of these things. The theory is that a lot of these are going to fail and go to zero. Now, I may be wrong about that. It may turn out that there's a basket of cryptocurrencies that serve the purpose that cryptocurrencies need to serve, which is the ability to trade outside of banking systems, the ability to trade outside of government systems, the ability to cross borders with money. It may be that there's a good basket of, of 10, 20, 30, or 40 different cryptocurrencies that people like for various reasons, and they use them. And a lot of these have other features. Uh, they have uh, safe surfing features. They have... Um, uh, I think Made Safe Coin is one. They have all kinds of features. I don't even have time to go into exploring the other features that some of these coins have. But it very well could be the case that I'm wrong and uh, a bunch of these don't go to zero. But there's also a possibility that some of these like Ethereum that are worth a billion now are going to go to zero in the future. So if you're trying to pick a top, you have to be very careful about doing so. And anytime you're shorting something, if you see it begin to turn against you and go into new highs, you need to get out because you don't know how high it can go. You can see on this factoids chart here that uh, you have no idea how high it can go. It went from one and uh, if we pull out, uh, you can see it was all the way down here. Uh, that That is uh, 0.09 and uh, so you can get absolutely killed. Be very careful if you're short, shorting these cryptocurrencies. So let's get to the main story of the night. That's going to be what I'm going to call peak fail or, or peak hoax or whatever you want to call it, is uh, these people who won't admit they're wrong when they're proven wrong. Now, the first one I've talked about in the past, and there's so much out there. I'm just covering this one article 
but there are so many articles. There's uh, one called The Fossil Fuels Hoax, The Myth of Fossil Fuels. And this, this article is about peak oil. Now, I never bought into the peak oil theory. And one of the reasons why is because if you remember back in the 70s, I think it was Paul Ehrlich, it was one of those guys, you had the limits to growth people who were saying that we're going to run out of food, we're going to run out of this, we're going to run out of everything. It's the same type of thinking that you have on the far left now with craziness about carbon taxes and all this stupidity. If you remember, there's a hole in the ozone layer. You remember that one? Uh, they come up with these stupid theories that have no basis in reality. Well, peak oil is another one of those. Uh, we, the world is awash in oil right now. There's so much oil in the world right now that they're finding that the dirty oils, that's one of the things that's causing such problems in Venezuela, is Venezuela's oil is fairly dirty, and so is the um, North Dakota and the fracked oil. Is, is, is pretty dirty. So the price of those, uh, some have reported as low as negative 50 cents a barrel because uh, that's not like uh, Brent and Light Sweet and some of the other crudes that are very, very clean. So these other ones that are dirty that have, uh, my understanding is a very high sulfur content, they have to be cleaned. So they're very expensive to, um, to process. So their price is much lower. So we don't have peak oil. In fact, we have a glut of oil. We have tankers that are uh, being filled up and we're running out of space to store the oil. Now, it's actually much worse than that because uh, I've mentioned before that I don't buy into the, uh, the organic oil concept, the fossil fuel concept. And I think there's some pretty good evidence now that we're starting to see, especially with the uh, oil wells filling back up, that oil is actually just a liquid that's produced by the earth. I can't explain it. Uh, I don't understand it. Uh, but that's the explanation. I'll read a little bit of this and then play the video below. The peak oil hoax exposed. Oil is nearly limitless. Oil along with water self replenishes. They're the lifeblood of the earth. Oil should be as inexpensive as water. Why then do we get the scarcity of oil shoved down our throats? Why are gas prices so high? The answer here are political and go even deeper still religious, but that is out of the scope of this article. Let's look at the factual proof that exposes peak oil as the utter fraud that it is. Now I'm going to play a little bit of this video here, so bear with me. To have been generated, to have been created by the decay of uh, living matter, you would need a cube of decaying matter 50 miles on a side in order to create that much oil. And on, unless all of the dinosaurs on Earth just formed this huge pile, then there's no way that could have happened. But we never ran out of oil in America. And there's plenty of oil still in America that we can use. I know that the oil fields in Alaska, that's a real bone of contention for a lot of people. They don't want to drill in Alaska, mess up the wildlife and such. But just recently in North Dakota, there was discovered an oil field. It's one of the largest ever discovered. There is more oil in this field in North Dakota than in just about any field ever discovered in the entire world. It's probably the second largest oil field that has ever been found. And also, there are oil wells that were believed to have been used up that you won't, the media won't tell you this, but a lot of these oil fields have begun to fill up again. They're being re replenished with oil. There have been maybe four times, four or five times people have said, we've reached the peak, that's it, we're running out. And every time they've said that we've ran out of oil, then they've found a whole lot more oil. Did I miss something here? I mean, we are supposed to be running out of oil. Why is it that we keep finding more? Because it's a lie. And I want you to remember there that he's referring to some of these capped oil wells uh, that were nearly completely depleted 
they're finding evidence that they're actually refilling. So not only do we have capped oil wells in the U.S. that were capped when they were full because the whole thing has been a scam from the beginning. It has to do with the petrodollar and the gold standard and the Rockefellers, etc. But we have ones that were capped and stopped when they were drained down and they filled back up with oil. So that tells you that this peak oil thing, uh, it's a hoax. And the, the question is, why don't the people, I, I hate to you know call people out, but people like SRS Rocco, who have completely bought into this nonsense, continue with it. Now, let, let me show you one. Let, let me give you an example of where I, I made a prediction and I was wrong. When I predicted $100 an ounce silver, uh, back many years ago. And I was clearly wrong. I had no idea uh, how much power the cartel had. And I thought for sure that as soon as the next QE hit, uh, we would surpass that $50 price, hit $100 price. I was wrong. I was dead wrong. But the question is, why are the people who are talking about peak oil and some other things not admitting that they're wrong? Now, this one is kind of a sticky point for me because I never bought into this. Uh, I was a little bit taken aback when I saw Jeff Berwick buy into it because Jeff Berwick was a person that I thought, actually, I thought the guy was an atheist. He was an anarcho-capitalist and, uh, in my opinion, strict King James-only Christians that take the Bible literally aren't aren't anarchists because the Bible's very, very clear about obeying existing authority, praying for leaders, uh, not resisting the powers that be, obeying the powers that be, and all these things. Um, Jesus telling Peter to go and uh, pay their taxes. He'll, he'll catch a fish with a coin in his mouth. All of the things that are in the Bible talk about uh, being an example by obeying the laws. So it was kind of shocking for me to see Jeff Berwick jump on this Shemitah train. Now, one being honest about this would have to say, especially now with the move in the market, uh, we had a pretty good sell-off in the Dow Industrials near the beginning of the year there. When the, when the year started out, uh, we, we fell fairly hard on the Dow 30. But recently, with whatever the, either the Fed is doing or just the markets themselves are doing, you can see we've, we've got a fairly strong rally going here. And uh, one could argue that, uh, yes, maybe we did get a top there at this Shemitah time period, but it's certainly nothing like the collapse that was predicted. Now, what's interesting is that we have... Uh, I'll use this article from before it's news uh, just to show you an example. Uh, the title is Man's Supernatural Encounter with God Reveals the Missing Link to Some of the Greatest End Time Mysteries Ever. Well, what, what's the mystery? Uh, you can see here, when the end of the Shemitah cycle came in September 2015, myself and many other prophetic voices, you know, if someone calls themselves a prophetic voice, you, you really need to think about that. We're expecting the stock market to crash along with other domino events that would be the beginning of the birth pangs leading us into the Great Tribulation. Whether you hold a pre-trib, midweek, or post-seven-year tribulation, all we're expecting something big to happen that did not happen. No, I wasn't expecting something big to happen that did not happen. Um, when nothing happened in September, many Christians and prophetic teachers alike either thought the Lord was delaying his coming or they figured we were wrong and we'd have to wait another one or two Shemitah cycles before the Lord's return. No, uh, no. Shemitah cycles have nothing to do with the Lord's return. Uh, so what's the explanation here? Well, the thing is that's interesting about this, and this is a pattern I pointed out before. This is something that has been repeated many times throughout history. You have cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses. You have cults like the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, there's a whole bunch of cults, if you go back into history, from the 19th, 18th, 17th, 16th centuries, where you find Christians where a particular leader predicted that Christ was going to return on such and such a date, even though the Bible clearly teaches 
that no man knows the day or the hour, even the Son, but the Father only. So that, I mean, people can debate whether or not Jesus, when he when he was stating that, uh, didn't know at that time and knows now. Nevertheless, that's a very, very strong statement to say that only the Father knows that date, not even the Son, because there are virtually no things that you can name other than that, that the Son doesn't know, that the Father knows. So that's a very strong statement. And yet we have these people coming out saying that they can count the date, they can know the date, and all these things. And it would be one thing if these people would come out and say, okay, well, we thought we were right, but we were wrong. But they never do that. What they do is they revise history or they change the facts. Now, look at this one here. Uh, This is going to be an explanation of how we're somehow in these days right now, but they're going to tell us that the days were shortened. So let me read a little bit of this. Um, I was reading Mark chapter 13, verses 19 and 20, jumped out at me. I'll write these verses in the parallel verse from Matthew 24, 21. Then I will share what, uh, what I see here that's so important. Mark 13, 19. Because those days will be days of distress, the great tribulation, unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut those days, actually this isn't King James Version, uh, but for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. And then it goes into Matthew. And he says, these verses above are saying that the days of distress will be shortened. This is talking about the days of the Great Tribulation. And they go on to explain that they think that we are now in the shortening of those days. You see that? What I'm going to share in this study is that I believe we're now in the shortening of those days. So this is what they do. When they're wrong, they begin to modify doctrine. Uh, That's what we have with the peak oil, they're wrong. There was no peak oil. Just like Paul Early predicted starvation, there was no starvation. Starvation is only caused by corrupt governments in various countries. We're seeing the beginnings of starvation in Venezuela, which is which at one point was the breadbasket of South America. So we know these things have nothing to do with uh, some type of prophetic event. They're just uh, governments mismanaging things. Uh, We don't have peak oil. We don't have a Shemitah crash. And uh, what we have is peak failure. And we'll talk to you next time.